Election interference. Former President Donald Trump has been indicted and arraigned for interfering with the 2020 election. The alleged facts of this conspiracy are astounding. Now we've covered the legality of the crimes alleged, but it's worth exploring the facts of the crimes as well. Uh, Prosecutor Jack Smith lays out a story that is as yet unproven in court, but is the most comprehensive look at the conspiracy to overturn and subvert the 2020 election to date. Now this story takes place in two months between November 14th, 2020 and Joe Biden's swearing in ceremony on January 20th, 2021. The indictment says that the conspiracy conspiracy started 11 days after the general election. Now, during that time, we got the worst gang of criminals to work with Donald Trump since Harry and Marv in Home Alone 2. This cast of characters is enumerated in paragraph eight, starting with co-conspirator one, an attorney who was willing to spread knowingly false claims and pursue strategies that defendants 2020 re-election campaign attorneys would not. You guessed it, give it up for America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani. A co-conspirator two, an attorney who devised and attempted to implement a strategy to leverage the vice president's ceremonial role, overseeing the certification proceeding to obstruct the certification of the presidential election. That is top Republican legal mind, John Eastman. Co-conspirator three, an attorney whose unfounded claims of election fraud, the defendant privately acknowledged to others sounded crazy. Nonetheless, the defendant embraced and publicly amplified co-conspirator three's disinformation. You know her from shipwrecks of old, give it up for Sidney the Kraken Powell. Then there's co-conspirator four, a justice department official who worked on civil matters and who with the defendant attempted to use the justice department to open sham election crime investigations and influence state legislatures with knowingly false claims of election fraud. He was a lawyer in the environment and natural resources division until Trump offered to make him acting attorney general. Yes, this is assistant attorney general. Jeffrey, we'll call you when there's an oil spill, Clark. Then there's co-conspirator five, an attorney who assisted in devising and attempting to implement a plan to submit fraudulent slates of presidential electors to obstruct the certification proceedings. This is appellate lawyer and humorous name haver, Kenneth Cheesebro. Uh, then there is finally co-conspirator six, a political consultant who helped implement a plan to submit fraudulent slates of presidential electors to obstruct the certification proceeding. Co-conspirator six appears to be Boris Epstein, one of Trump's advisors, though this has yet to be confirmed. Uh, Epstein is uh, best known for writing Trump's controversial Holocaust Remembrance Day speech in which he omitted any mention of Jewish people. Yeah, this has not been a great day for the legal profession because all six of the co-conspirators may in fact be lawyers. Uh, these six co-conspirators could be indicted in the coming weeks or months, uh, or they could be government witnesses. No one knows at the moment, and it may be up to them. But the bottom line is Trump worked with this cast of co-conspirators to subvert the Electoral Count Act and stop Congress from certifying the election. The ECA governs the process of casting and counting electoral college votes for president and vice president, and the statute sets forth a timeline for states to appoint presidential elections in November and for electors to cast their votes in December, and describes the process uh, that Congress should follow when it counts the state's electoral votes in January. These days, each state casts electoral votes based on their state's popular vote and then sends their electoral votes along with the state executive's certification that they were the state's legitimate electors to Congress to be counted at an official proceeding. Now, the indictment says that Trump and his cronies organized, quote, fraudulent slates of electors in seven targeted states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, attempting to mimic the procedure that the legitimate electors were supposed to follow under the Constitution and other federal and state laws. The conspirators caused these fake electors to, quote, meet on the day appointed by federal law on which legitimate electors were to gather and cast their votes, cast fraudulent votes for the defendant, and sign certificates falsely representing that they were legitimate electors. One day before Trump was indicted in D.C., 16 of these fraudulent electors were indicted in Michigan for participating in this scheme. And Trump also attempted to use the power and authority of the Justice Department to launch a sham criminal investigation into voter fraud that didn't occur. This apparently included sending a letter outlining false claims that the DOJ discovered massive election irregularities and recommending that these states call a special legislative session to determine, quote, who won the most legal votes and consider appointing a new slate of electors. Now, some of the most troubling allegations involved Jeffrey Clark, the environmental lawyer at the DOJ who Trump wanted to appoint as attorney general in the waning weeks of his term. Uh, Clark met secretly with Trump on December 22nd, failing to inform his superiors of the meeting, which is, of course, DOJ protocol. Now, it's obvious why he didn't tell them. Trump and his allies allegedly tried to get acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen to sign a letter that made, quote, knowingly false claims of election fraud to officials in the targeted states through a formal letter under the acting Attorney General's signature, thus giving the defendants lies the backing of the federal government and attempting to improperly influence the target states to replace legitimate Biden electors with defendants. 
Now, apparently Rosen wanted nothing to do with this, and on December 26th, he told Clark not to meet with Trump again without notice. Clark said the meeting was an accident and he would abide by Rosen's directive. But the next morning, he had a three minute phone call with Trump. And afterwards, Trump met with Rosen and the acting deputy attorney general and told them that he was considering replacing Rosen with Clark. Quote, quote people tell me Jeffrey Clark is great. I should put him in. When Rosen refused to say the election was corrupt, Trump told him to quote, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. And of course, people are pointing to this quote as evidence that Trump actually knew that the election was not fraudulent. On December 28th, Clark circulated the letter Trump wanted Rosen to send. And it's important to note here how insane it is that Jeff Clark, who was still officially assigned to the environmental department, was suddenly running point on Trump's maneuvers with the DOJ. He was sending his boss, Jeff Rosen, the same letter that Rosen had already refused to sign. Uh, Clark proposed sending versions of this to battleground states that Biden won. And here's the claims made in that letter, which the government says are false. Uh, the Justice Department had, quote, identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states. The Justice Department believed that in Georgia and other states, two valid slates of electors had gathered at the proper location on December 14th, and that both sets of ballots had been transmitted to Congress. That is co-conspirator for Jeff Clark's letter sought to advance the defendant's fraudulent elector plan by using the authority of the Justice Department to falsely present the fraudulent electors as a valid alternative to the legitimate electors. The Justice Department urged the state legislature to convene a special legislative session to create the opportunity to, among other things, choose the fraudulent electors over the legitimate electors. But Rosen rebuffed Clark again and told him not to engage with Trump. On uh, New Year's Eve, Trump summoned Rosen and other DOJ lawyers and told them he might have to change leadership at the DOJ. Now, the Justice Department traditionally operates fairly independently from the White House. Uh, presidents aren't supposed to order the Attorney General to make legal decisions, but here was Trump insisting that they send the letter. And on January 2nd, Clark continued his insubordination by asking his boss and others to sign the letter Trump wanted to send. He told them that Trump was considering firing Rosen and replacing him with Clark, but that he declined the job if Rosen would just cave and send the letter with false fraud allegations. On January 3rd, Clark revised the fraud letter, changing the, its language about concerns to a stronger false claim that, quote, as of today, there is evidence of significant irregularities that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states. Now, that was apparently enough for Trump to give him the acting attorney general job because the two met and Clark accepted the job. So Clark spent all day scheming with Trump and testing the limits of the new power. Now, apparently, quote, a deputy White House counsel tried to dissuade Clark from assuming the role of acting attorney general. The deputy White House counsel reiterated to co-conspirator for Jeff Clark that there had not been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that if the defendant remained in office nonetheless, there would be, quote, riots in every major city in the United States. Jeff Clark responded, quote, well, Deputy White House Counsel, that's why there's an Insurrection Act. Clark apparently then called his boss and told him that he was now the acting attorney general. Uh, Rosen, quote, responded that he would not accept being fired by a subordinate and immediately scheduled a meeting with the defendant uh, for that evening. But there was apparently a very strong push by the Justice Department attorneys to stop Trump and Clark from implicating the DOJ in overturning a valid election. In fact, Trump only gave up on his plan to install Clark as AG after, quote, he was told that it would would result in mass resignations at the Justice Department and of his own White House counsel. Of course, mass resignations are not something that happen every day, and if the Justice Department lawyers resigned en masse, then it would probably have blown the whistle on what the conspirators were trying to do. Jeffrey Clark uh, drafted a letter to Georgia saying, quote, the Department of Justice is investigating various irregularities in the 2020 election for President of the United States. The department will update you as we're able on investigatory progress, but at this time we have identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states, including the state of Georgia. Now this was false. The DOJ plays no role in certifying the winner of the presidential election. State investigations and audits confirm that Biden won the state and every court which considered the issue ruled against Trump. But the indictment has a whole section on Trump's efforts to overturn the Georgia election results. Now, this section of the indictment is pretty funny because it actually describes two different methods of attack Trump took, one with Sidney Powell and the other with Rudy Giuliani. Now, the Powell method only takes up one paragraph because her lawsuit was dismissed so quickly and obviously, but it has some great details. On November 16th, Trump's, quote, executive assistant sent Powell and others a document containing bullet points critical of a certain voting machine company writing, 
uh, see attached, please include as is or almost as is in lawsuit. Co-conspirator three, Sidney Powell responded nine minutes later writing, quote, it must go in all suits in Georgia and Pennsylvania immediately with a fraud claim that requires the entire election to be set aside in those states and machines impounded for nonpartisan professional inspection. Now I can only assume that this was a reply all given uh, the abundance of all caps, but the indictment does not say. Uh, nine days later, Powell filed a lawsuit, quote, against the governor of Georgia falsely alleging massive election fraud accomplished through the voting machine company's election software and hardware. In the next chunk of the paragraph, we have a vindication of Trump's ability to actually assess legal issues. Quote, before the lawsuit was even filed, the defendant retweeted a post promoting it. The defendant did this despite the fact that when he had discussed co-conspirator three's far-fetched public claims regarding the voting machine company in private with advisors, the defendant had conceded that they were unsupported and that co-conspirator three sounded, quote, crazy. Co-conspirator three's Georgia lawsuit was dismissed on December 7th. It's actually kind of refreshing to hear Trump uh, be right on the money for once. Uh, Sidney Powell is in fact crazy, uh, but this may be a, a broken clock uh, type situation. But in the next paragraph though, the DOJ goes on to the much more worrisome moves by Trump and Rudy Giuliani to pressure Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger into overturning the state's election results. Basically Trump and Giuliani and Raffensperger go back and forth with Raffensperger and other Georgia officials calmly and repeatedly telling Trump that there were neither dead nor illegitimate voters in large numbers in Georgia. Eventually, this defeatist attitude infected Trump's own team. Quote, as early as mid-November, for instance, the senior campaign advisor had informed Trump that his claims of a large number of dead voters in Georgia were untrue. With respect to the persistent false claim regarding State Farm Arena, on December 8th, the senior campaign advisor wrote in an email, when our research and campaign legal team can't back up any of the claims made by our elite strike force legal team, you can see why we're 0 and 32 in our cases. I'll obviously hustle to help on all fronts, but it's tough to own any of this when it's all just conspiracy beam down from the mothership. Yes, believe it or not, the Trump camp did actually refer to this group of some of the worst lawyers who have ever practiced in America as the elite strike force legal team. Now, as you can probably tell, Trump is probably going to need a really good lawyer based on these facts. But if you need a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you've had an injury or death in the family, suffered a data breach, or were involved in a car crash, we can represent you or help find the right attorney who can. Just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. The link is down below. Uh, but of course, uh, all this stuff is a little silly and easy to make fun of now, but at the time, Giuliani and Trump singled out and harassed individual election staffers. Quote, at the hearing before the Georgia House of Representatives Government Affairs Committee, Giuliani played the State Farm Arena video again and falsely claimed that it showed voter fraud right in front of people's eyes and was the tip of the iceberg. Then he cited two election workers by name, baselessly accusing them of quite obviously surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. Uh, these workers were Shane Moss and Ruby Freeman, who subsequently received numerous death threats. Uh, Shane Moss testified before the January 6th committee about what actually happened. Mr. Giuliani accused you and your mother of passing some sort of USB drive to each other. Uh, what was your mom actually handing you on that video? A ginger mint. And in other testimony, Ruby Freeman described how unsafe uh, Giuliani and Trump's actions made her feel in her own community. Now I won't even introduce myself by my name anymore. I get nervous when I have to give my name for food orders. Around the week of January 6th, the FBI informed me that I needed to leave my home for safety. Understood. How, how long did you stay out? Did you, you know, remain outside of your home? I, I stayed away from my home for approximately two months. And Trump continued to drag Freeman and Moss's names through the mud in his now infamous perfect call with Brad Raffensperger. Uh, having to do with uh, Ruby Freeman, that's, uh, she's a vote scammer, a professional vote scammer and hustler. And later in the call, Trump of course asked Raffensperger to find 11,780 votes for him. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have because we won the state. 
Similarly, on December 7th, despite still having established no fraud in Michigan, co-conspirator one sent a text intended for the Michigan Senate Majority Leader, quote, so I need you to pass a joint resolution from the Michigan legislature that states that the election is in dispute, there's an ongoing investigation by the legislature, and the electors sent by Governor Whitmer are not the official electors of the state of Michigan and do not fall within the safe harbor deadline of December 8th under Michigan law. Now, I'd be curious to hear why the indictment says that Giuliani intended that text to be sent to the Michigan Senate Majority Leader. Did he send that to someone close to the Majority Leader who would then pass along the message? Or did he actually send that to someone who wasn't connected at all, who then turned it over to the FBI? Uh, Hopefully we'll get an answer to that question. Anyway, quote, on December 14th, the Michigan House Speaker and Michigan Senate Majority Leader announced that contrary to the defendant's requests, they would not decertify the legitimate election results or electors in Michigan. Now, about a month after trying to dupe state electoral officials, Trump and his merry gang, uh, quote, developed a new plan to marshal individuals who would have served as the defendant's electors had he won the popular vote in seven targeted states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and cause those individuals to make and send to the vice president and Congress false certifications that they were legitimate electors. Under the plan, the submission of these fraudulent slates would create a fake controversy at the certification proceeding and position the vice president presiding on January 6th as president of the Senate to supplant legitimate electors with the defendant's fake electors and certify the defendant as president. Uh, Paragraph 58 has a, a fun account of how this would have gone down as recalled by an Arizona attorney invited to be a fake elector. The next day on December 8th, Kenneth Cheesebro called the Arizona attorney on Boris Epstein's list. In an email after the call, the Arizona attorney recounted his conversation with Cheesebro as follows. I just talked to the gentleman who did that memo, Ken Cheesebro. His idea is basically that all of us have our electors send in their votes, even though the votes aren't legal under federal law because they're not signed by the governor. So that members of Congress can fight about whether they should be counted on January 6th. They could potentially argue that they're not bound by the federal law because they're Congress and make the law, etc. Kind of wild slash creative. I'm happy to discuss. My comment to him was that I guess there's no harm in it, legally at least, i.e. we would would just be sending in fake electoral votes to Pence so that someone in Congress can make an objection when they start counting votes and start arguing that the fake votes should be counted. A couple little fun editorials by this attorney that I want to point out. Uh, first, he points out that the fake electors would be illegal under federal law. Then the lawyer pivots to conclude that the scheme would result in congressional debate that uh, legally at least would do no harm. There's no harm in it legally at least is doing a lot of heavy lifting, like Schwarzenegger levels of lifting, like Joan Rivers levels of lifting. And secondly, wild slash creative is probably how you want to describe an ugly drawing that your friend's kid made, not really a plan to overturn the presidential election. But if you encounter a legal theory that is wild slash creative, you should probably travel expeditiously in the other direction. Now, the other people familiar with Trump's plan, namely his co-conspirators, absolutely refused to stand by it when push came to shove. Quote, on December 13th, the defendant asked the senior campaign advisor for an update on what was going on with the elector plan and directed him to put out a statement on electors. When the senior campaign advisor related those developments in text messages to the deputy campaign manager, a senior advisor to the defendant and a campaign staffer, the deputy campaign manager responded, here's the thing, the way this has morphed, it's a crazy plan, so I don't know who wants to put their name on it. And it continues. The senior advisor wrote, certifying illegal votes, in turn, the participants in the group text message refused to have a statement regarding electors attributed to their names because none of them could stand by it. Now, the indictment also alleges that Trump put extreme pressure on Mike Pence, including putting a damper on what I can only assume was a very bland Christmas dinner. Uh, On Christmas Day, Pence called Trump to wish him a Merry Christmas, but Trump steered the conversation to the election, leading Pence to tell him, you know, I don't think I have authority to change the outcome. And here the indictment cites uh, to the vice president's contemporaneous notes to allege that Trump told Pence that the DOJ was finding major infractions. uh, And that happened on December 29th, long after multiple DOJ officials told Trump that there was actually no fraud. Uh, On January 1st, 2021, Trump allegedly berated Pence for refusing to go along with his proposal. In response, the defendant told the vice president, you're too honest. Then on January 4th, Trump met with Pence, one of the co-conspirators, the vice president's chief of staff, and the vice president's counsel to convince Pence that he should reject Joe Biden's electoral votes or resend them back to the states. During the meeting, as reflected in the vice president's contemporaneous notes, the defendant made knowingly false claims of election fraud, including bottom line, won every state by hundreds of thousands of votes, and we won every state. 
Uh, side note, uh, Mike Pence is now selling merch that says too honest to capitalize on this historic moment. Trump met with Pence again on January 5th to convince him to overturn the election. But when Pence refused, Trump, quote, grew frustrated and told the vice president that the defendant would have to publicly criticize him. But quote, upon learning this, the vice president's chief of staff was concerned for the vice president's safety and alerted the head of the vice president's secret service detail. Later that day, Trump tweeted that, quote, the vice president and I are in total agreement that the vice president has the power to act. As an aside, this is probably important because it shows that Trump wasn't just lying about whether he believed he won the election. As far as we know, Pence never agreed with Trump that the vice president had the legal authority to do what Trump wanted him to do. And the indictment says that Trump lied about Pence's intentions, which theoretically moved the conspiracy forward. And on January 6th, Trump tweeted about Pence repeatedly. Staffers from Senator Ron Johnson's office sent the fraudulent certificates to Pence's office, but a Pence staffer refused to accept them. The indictment says Trump exploited the violence at the Capitol to pressure Pence. When staffers left him alone in the dining room, he tweeted that, quote, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country. And just one minute later, the Secret Service had to evacuate the vice president to a secure location. Uh, they took Pence to a place where he could never be found, presumably a room with a woman in it. But quote, upon learning this, the vice president's chief of staff was concerned for the vice president's safety and alerted the head of the vice president's secret service detail. While Mike Pence was hiding from writers, Trump took this opportunity to pressure lawmakers into delaying the certification and Trump had Giuliani call five senators and a representative. In one of the calls, co-conspirator one left a voicemail intended for a United States Senator that said, we need you, our Republican friends, to try to just slow it down so we can get these legislatures to get more information to you. And I know they're reconvening at eight tonight, but the only strategy we can follow is to object to numerous states and raise issues so that we get ourselves into tomorrow, ideally until the end of tomorrow. And later that night, Giuliani claimed that illegal immigrants had voted in substantial numbers in Arizona and that Georgia gave you a number in which 65,000 people who were underage voted. Now, Trump supporters insist that Trump really believed the election was stolen. And we covered the implications of Trump's mental state in the prior video that we did on this. And while I suppose anything is possible, it's hard to believe when he was being rebuffed so strongly by the Justice Department and so many other people at the same time. Especially because lawyers and advisors kept telling Trump that he lost. One deputy White House counsel apparently said, quote, there is no world, there is no option in which you do not leave the White House on January 20th. And it is alleged that Trump acknowledged privately that he lost. Uh, for example, after the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff urged Trump to not take action on a national security issue, Trump agreed saying, quote, yeah, you're right, it's too late for us, we're going to give that to the next guy. That was on January 3rd, just three days before the Trump-inspired voters came to the Capitol and interrupted the certification. And the New York Times reports that the special counsel had access to a previously unseen internal memo from the 2020 Trump campaign, describing in detail the plot by Donald Trump and his lawyers to subvert the election results in six states. The memo was written by Ken Cheesebro, and it describes a three-pronged plan to prevent Congress from certifying Joe Biden's victory on January 6, 2020. The memo was sent to a Wisconsin lawyer, James R. Troupas, uh, the lead attorney for for the Trump campaign in Wisconsin, who oversaw the fake elector scheme in his state. Quote, Trubus filed a lawsuit in December 2020 asking the Wisconsin Supreme Court to throw out hundreds of thousands of absentee ballots, saying they violated voting requirements. The court ultimately rejected the lawsuit. Now, Cheesebro wrote to Trubus saying, quote, it seems feasible the Trump campaign could subvert Biden's victory. His plan would, quote, force the members of Congress, the media, and the American people to focus on the substantive evidence of illegal election and counting activities in the six contested states, provided three things happen. And according to Cheesebro's plan, quote, Republican electors in all six states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin would meet and cast votes for Trump on the 14th of December, 2020, the deadline for electors to send their votes to Congress for certification in January. Uh, attorneys in each of the six states would simultaneously file lawsuits that would lead to either a Trump victory or a Biden loss which would be pending on the 6th of January, the certification date. And then finally, on the day the Congress meets to certify the electors votes, uh, quote, Pence presiding over the joint session takes the position that it is his constitutional power and duty alone as president of the Senate to both open and count the votes and that anything in the Electoral Count Act to the contrary is unconstitutional. Now, before Donald Trump goes to jail, I'm sure he'd love to have one last home-cooked meal, which you can do with today's sponsor, because with HelloFresh, you can make it exactly how you want, even cooked extremely well done and slathered in ketchup. You know, you do you. But fall is right around the corner, and HelloFresh is here to help you plan for a busy season ahead with tasty dishes delivered to your door. Simply choose the recipes and pick your delivery date, and then lay back and enjoy the last days of summer knowing that dinner is covered. HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 chef-crafted recipes that you can select from every 
every week. From family friendly to fit and wholesome, you'll always find something new and exciting to try and love. HelloFresh is a great way to eat delicious fresh food while still being healthy. Now I'm a do it yourself person and I have to say I was initially pretty skeptical about HelloFresh. I'm a pretty good cook, so I didn't think that I needed the help, but I actually loved it. Even for an experienced cook, HelloFresh delivers new ingredients and recipes that I would never try on my own. And of course, everything was delivered straight to my door, so I didn't have to do any shopping. The produce actually gets to you faster than a grocery store, so it arrives at peak freshness and flavor. And it's also super easy to save time. HelloFresh cuts out the meal planning and prep, so the recipes only take 20 to 30 minutes to cook, literally less time to cook than it would normally take to do the shopping. And HelloFresh is at least 25% cheaper than takeout. So if you'd like to try HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code 50LegalEagle at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. Yes, you can actually get 50% off plus free shipping by clicking on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description. So click on the link below and use the code 50 Legal Eagle at checkout. After that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.